Hello, hey, assembled crowd. Uh, this is great to be here. Great to kick off this um, session. I think there's four of us from the UK. Yeah, yep. And so a brief intro to Helen is um, she is part of many collaborations. She does some work for the BBC and also is um, a member of the Festival of the Unspoken Nerd, which is quite <laughs> sweet. So, spoken. We're spoken not unspoken. Nerd. We're very right. loud. Yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> And so you have lots of supporters from England. I've been in touch with multiple people who are like, wow, you got Helen Arnie to show up? Yeah, right. <laughs> cool. Only because I'm still in my living room. Oh, well, that's great. You can be in your pajamas. <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> take it away, Helen. It's all you. Thank you. This is great to be part of this. Hello, everyone who's here. Hello, um, anyone who's in the future who is listening to this online, because I think these are all being recorded. Hello. Uh, so my name's Helen. I um, do a whole load of different things at the moment. Uh, part of my time, I write songs about science. Part of my time, I write um, stuff about science. I'm a science presenter some days. I make radio shows. Um, I produce Festival of Spoken Nerd. I curate shows with too many Helens in. Uh, and um, a lot of my time I spend looking after my three-year-old toddler who I have to pick up at five o'clock. So I'm hoping this session <laughs> is, oh no, half five, it's fine. The session's gonna be fine. Um, so uh, I was really, really interested in the uh, previous session with Shashi because he was talking about music and maths working well together and how there's, there is research about uh, how, how musical education can help your mathematical and scientific education and, and that is a big influence on me because I chose to go to Imperial College to study physics not because it had a great physics department which it does um, and not because it had a 90% male to 10% female ratio which was also part of the thinking um, but it was because it had four orchestras and no music department and three choirs and a radio station and a musical theater society. And, and it was a completely medical science, maths, computing, engineering university. And yet there were enough uh, students who wanted to spend all of their spare time playing music and they did and we did. And that's part of what I do now. I combine science with music. And there's so many musicians I know who love science, so many scientists I know who love music. Uh, live, love music. And um, it's frustrating because scientists who do music can do music for fun, but musicians who love science find it very hard to do science. It is very hard. It used to be harder and now it's a bit easier. You can join a, a MOOC, you can do an open university course, you can, you can get involved in science now. And that's what I feel like a lot of the stuff we do with Festival of the Spoken Nerd is, is people who loved science in school, left it behind and now want to be able to get their hands back on it and not just watch Brian Cox on the television, but actually go somewhere and do something and meet people and watch a show uh, and have their brain worked in different ways um, and just to enjoy science. So that's kind of, uh, where I'm coming from. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that you can actually teach science with songs. I apologize to Tiffany if that is a kind of rogue no. idea that I'm bringing in. <laughs> we've got, no, we've actually had a, a good couple conversations about this with some people as the years have gone on. Um, and it is an interesting conversation, but yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I, th I feel like they, it, it, it's, it's possible to to get some things across. But I think if, if all you're looking for with science and songs is to teach science, then you're missing out on so many other things that science songs can do. So if, if your song is not actually teaching some, you know, some science, I mean, uh, great, let's, let's all learn uh, quantum mechanics from a single song. I don't think that, that is, I mean, whoever writes that song is just gonna, just become uh, world famous. Um, but there's so many other things to do with it, like making ideas stick in your head. There's nothing that sticks in your head like a song. I get people quoting my songs back at me and telling me that they've they passed their uh, GCSE exam because I wrote a song about bananas 
and how radioactive they are. And it came up as a GCSE question in last year's physics paper. And I had so many people email me <laughs> and so many parents email me and tell me that basically <laughs> they'd only passed the GCSE because they'd been listening to my song about how radioactive bananas are. And I'm like, that, that is where songs come in. They make you remember things. Um, they make things stick in your head. They make you curious about finding out more for yourself in a way that you actually do learn stuff. They, they consolidate what you've learned. And I think that's, that's a key thing. I know you're, you know that something songs can do is consolidating your knowledge and celebrating it and celebrating and inspiring you to learn more. So I feel like those are the kind of things that I try and do with my songs. Um, a bit about me, I've mentioned I, I uh, studied physics at Imperial College um, <laughs> two decades ago. Uh, and since then I've done all sorts of things. Uh, all of my songs that I've recorded are free to download from my Bandcamp page. So if you go to helenarly.com, you can link to my Bandcamp page, uh, download all my songs for free. Um, you can find loads of them on YouTube as well. Uh, one of the big things I do, you've mentioned Festival of the Spoken Nerd. Uh, it's this big comedy show. We take it around the country. We've played Las Vegas. We've played the Royal Albert Hall. We've um, toured around the country. We've done the Edinburgh Fringe. We've recorded three shows, um, which you can download for the grand total of Pi Pounds, which is 3.14 pounds. <laughs> I, I don't know what that is in dollars, but it's literally, it's like pennies. Yeah, so it's not especially a lot. With the whole Brexit crash business, it's just <laughs> going to be almost no money. Uh, so you can get hold of those three shows, Full Frontal Nerdity, Just for Graphs, and You Can't Polish a Nerd. Guess what? We <laughs> like puns. Um, so this show that I do there, I do songs quite often on this thing, ukulele, or if you're um, really far away, it's the guitar. Perspective joke for you. Uh, and I do it with Matt Parker. Uh, let me find you. Here we go. Uh, there's Matt Parker. He's a stand up mathematician. Shashi, you will be really interested in what he does. Um, this is Steve Mould, who does science experiments and likes setting fire to things on stage. And that's me there. Um, and one of the things that we always do in the shows is um, I do three or four songs and we finish each show with a song that's specially written that kind of brings together every element of the show. So if in the show we had radioactive bananas, for example, and um, like the geometry of a football and uh, a 360 degree camera that distorts the world into a giant Mobius loop, all of those things will come back in the song at the end. And that's one of the biggest challenges that I really like doing is um, trying to write a song, not just about whatever you want to write about, but um, a song that has to achieve a certain goal. Um, and like John Hinton earlier, if anyone is interested in writing uh, songs or having a song written for them about their research, I'm always up for that. And you can just approach me. My uh, email is incredibly easy to find on the internet. Um, right, so I think I've probably got time for a song. Now, let me have a think. Um, uh, what's, what song shall I do? Um, can I, uh, can I pull it out to, put it out to a vote? Sure. I've got a choice of songs. Uh, I can do a song that, um, I think is, is quite an educational song. I think it has a lot of information in it. Uh, and it's about solar physics. So I've got a song about solar physics. Uh, I've got a song about cryonic freezing which is more of a um, kind of a cultural science crossover song. Um, or, classic favourite, I learnt Tom Lehrer's Elements for a bet a few years ago. So um, you've got a choice of, I'll write them down, solar physics. So we right. have solar physics um, from Walter. We got one vote for solar physics. I'm just going to tune up my ukulele while... Um, Another well, vote for solar we'll physics. The sun has got his hus on. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, well, someone's asked for it by name, so I think that's pretty much... Uh, there you go. That's a, that's a dead set. Thank you for your votes. Uh, that was excellent. Uh, brilliant. I, I feel like I'm doing some kind of request song now. Uh, which is brilliant. Um, I'm looking forward to the Q&A and panel section at the end. I'm sure 
I've done an incredibly sketchy version of what I do. And ha, someone said, pass the hat. I'm like, Actually, no, that, was, that was my advisor. Online. Just, just download them. They're free. That was um, my advisor. You're going to love him. Don't worry. <laughs> um, so I, I'd love to answer more questions about um, what I write and how I write and, and what I've ended up doing with these um, live shows that we've created. But um, for now, I wish you'll do something. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a song um, that I wrote um, for a Radio 4 show called The Infinite Monkey Cage, hosted by Brian Cox and Robin Ince. So um, you might spot a little reference to that in the song. Um, and they asked me to write a song about something that was in the news at the time. So in the news at the time, there were all these incredible videos on the NASA YouTube channel of exploding sunspots, these coronal mass ejections, these things 25 times the size of Earth, like exploding out of the side of the sun, just incredible videos, images, amazing. Um, and the weird thing I spotted was that NASA had been uploading more and more of these over recent years. Um, and uh, I was starting to get worried about whether this, this is a total science thing. I see what they're doing. They're, they're just observing a lot more sunspots than normal. I started to think maybe we should get worried. Maybe we should start like um, uh, stockpiling food and uh, working out how to recreate life on earth using just me and the people that I managed to get into my basement when the world ends. You know, Maybe something bad was gonna happen with the sun, right? Because these coronal mass ejections are very powerful. They can knock out satellites, they can uh, ruin communications, they can stop power, they can blow up power generators. They're incredibly powerful um, if they hit Earth directly. So I thought, well, maybe we should start to plan for a future where we get hit by one of these. And then I spoke to one of my friends who's a solar physicist and she basically, she sent me straight, right? There's very little chance that one of these will directly hit us. And also, I didn't know this, uh, the sun goes into um, an 11 year cycle, right? So for half of the cycle, it gets more and more and more active, and then it gets less and less active over like 11 years. It's a short cycle, but it's meaningful because we were just coming up to the peak of that cycle, which is why NASA had worried me by uploading more and more of these videos to the point where I wrote this song because I've taken a different perspective on this now. I'm kind of wondering whether instead of this 11 year cycle being just a thing that the sun does, maybe it's a cry for help, right? Every 11 years, the sun feels like it's being neglected. People are looking at other parts of the universe. They're finding gravitational waves over there. They're landing tiny fridge sized landers on comets in the middle of nowhere that people are doing stuff that isn't anything to do with the sun. And every 11 years, it has a little strop. And this is what it sings. I used to be someone. Now I'm just another sun. One of a hundred thousand billion billion. You treat me insignificantly. You name a tabloid after me. If you know UK newspapers, there's actually two tabloids, the sun and the star. <laughs> um, it's synonymous with paparazzi. Just a, a backdrop for Brian Cox on TV. You, since Edwin Hubble, it's never been the same. Those pictures of other stars push me out of the frame. You never even gave me a proper name. Something like Alpha Centauri or Epsilon Tauri or Delta Libre or XR2948. These are genuine star names. Or Kevin. I just like that one. You've achieved nuclear fusion. Oh, well done. Made some helium from a little hydrogen. That's very cute. Well, every second I do that to 600 million times if I was Marilyn Monroe, you'd be the one I can't remember the name of from One Direction, which is all of One Direction. You should have stopped at Copernicus. Then I'd still be the center of your universe. You say I'm just an average ball of gas. Huh. I say 
say you're talking out of Uranus. I don't know if that's how it's pronounced because I'm the sun. Why would I know? I'm like eight minutes away. One point four million kilometers. That's my diameter. Tell me seriously with those parameters. Have you ever tried to put a hat on there? Hip, 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 hooray. Well, I'll be a red giant someday and your world will go up in flames. <laughs> but in the meantime, please join my Facebook fan page. Seriously, it's only got nine likes. Well, it, it's gone down to eight now since Pluto defriended me. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, I will hand over to the next um, speaker from our selection and then we'll come back for questions at the end. Thank you, Helen. That was awesome. Thank you. Uh, Bob, do you want to switch gears and we'll go with uh, Lewis? I think you're next. If you're ready. Um, working at how to... Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Uh, Welcome. Hello from Glasgow Science Centre. I'm in a playroom, literally. Um, so good to see you all. Um, I have a presentation planned just because the medium of dance and music is a wee bit, it's easier to see uh, visually. So I'm just, do you know how we, I can switch to show my screen? I can't, yeah, I do. If you put your cursor down at the bottom, um, uh -huh. you should see um, like participants Q and A and then the middle one is share. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay, so click that one. And if you need audio from your computer, you want to make sure to click that box at the bottom. Uh, actually, I'll leave the sound off. Will, will my voice still carry? Yeah, your voice sounds good. Great. Um, and then uh, just share it with your desktop and we can see it. It looks great. There you go, um, Okay, so good. I'm going to set a wee timer because I'm and speak for Scotland. Um, really delighted to be here, thank you. And it's been great to pop into um, and hear all the amazing work that's going on around science and music. Um, I guess I'll take is, is mu music and movements uh, and dance as well um, with the science Kaylee. And I know science Kaylee, Kaylee might not be a word that is so well known in North America. Um, it's a Scots Gaelic word. Uh, there's Kaylee in other parts of the UK as well. Um, but Kaylee, on one level, is just well, folk dancing. So the work I do with the Science Kaylee as an organization, as a social enterprise, in fact, is all about supporting uh, arts and science and STEM um, and, and, and learning. And I was going to just show a wee bit about our journey, if that sounds all right. Um, so my background is originally in neuroscience. I was also a fiddle player here in Edinburgh. Um, and Kaylee dancing is really informal. So when we say dancing, Kaylee dance is like folk dance. So maybe even easier than contra dances. It may be kind of a barn dance would be the equivalent in North America. But most cultures have some sort of folk dance and folk music uh, in their traditions. And what's joyful about, um, I guess, that's Kaylee dance is it's not about being the best dancer. Um, it's about just joining in, doing your part, um, and just having a good time. And um, whilst I was working in neuroscience, I was also working in these science festivals um, all across the UK and realizing that actually that's that spirit. So when I'm trying to teach people Kaylee dancing as a band, it's exactly the same idea that we're trying to do in science. It's, it's actually, I'm not necessarily encouraging everyone to be a scientist, but we want to bring that spirit that actually everyone can participate and everyone's got questions that are valid and are interesting. And so how do we bring that to, um, to science um, and especially with science festivals that we had a, a bit of a challenge but very often the type of people who are coming to science festivals are already interested in science so um, I guess a, a couple of years ago I decided to mash all my um, passions or my uh, interests into one thing and I wondered after a couple of drinks I'm not gonna lie uh, about whether or not we could actually use Scottish Kaylee answers to actually teach um, different scientific concepts and bring new audiences into um, uh, to think about science. Um, so I guess we began very much as public engagement, so thinking about how we could communicate specifically research. 
Um, and as I said, it's a spirit of participation. And again, it's not so much learning by the dance per se. You were not expecting people to come along to Kaylee's and learn loads of science, but we're hoping that it brings new people into the room and spark different conversations. And what we would do is we'd work with researchers to simplify the science and think about the kind of core concepts and how you can adapt or write new traditional Scottish dances to ex explore and explain these scientific concepts. And we provide training for the researchers and some of that would be based on my research. And then we would then create these kind of longer term resources that would be tied to the curriculum, especially in secondary, um, that people can go away and find out a bit more about the research if they're interested. And I suppose the key idea, because there's lots of great dancing and music kind of projects, but the great thing about folk dance is that you're not just watching someone else do the dance, you are actually doing it yourself. Um, and then hopefully that there's that kind of, well, if you can dance it, well, you can understand the basic concepts and the science behind it. So um, that's how we began. I should probably show you what that might look like. Um, this is an example of one of our dancers, the Strip the Leaf, which is based on a Scottish traditional dance, the, the Strip the Willow. It's all about photosynthesis. And in the full video, and all our videos are online, I should say, and they're all free and, and with the resources as well. But uh, before we have our PhD students talking about her research, about how it links with algae and global climate change, um, and then we show this video. And I will say that this is a slightly difficult, more difficult, more complicated version of the dance than we would do in person, but it just helps get some of the nuances and extra details of this, of photosynthesis and the light dependent reaction. So I'm gonna show it, hopefully it works. Um, don't worry about not having music on, um, you can hear, oh, you can hear the music um, online. To start with, light hits and chlorophyll molecules inside something called a photosystem tube and starts exciting the electrons. The excited electrons are then passed down a series of molecules called an electron transport chain. Energy is lost from the electrons as they go, and this is stored by changing ADP into ATP. The electrons then pass to photosystem 1, which reacts to a different wavelength of light. This re-excites the electrons and then passed along another electron transport. Next, we find a molecule which also helps store energy called NADP. Water, or H2O, enters the equation and reacts with the newly energized NADP. NADP is H2O, or proton, NADP is these electrons are then recycled to begin the whole process again. Okay, so one more time through. Light. And that repeats there, so I'm not, I'll stop at the repeat, uh, but you get the idea of how it links uh, each of the chemical reaction um, steps of the ADP is linked with the dance. There's a small adaptation to the traditional dance as well. Um, and as I said, we have about probably 50 of probably a first of these dances all across the different spectrums, linking real research to the curriculum and then developing resources for teachers to be able to apply this in class. Um, I guess in Scotland, it's quite common. Most schools will do some degree of Kaylee dancing, um, both in primary and in secondary. Um, if we're honest, in secondary, some schools love it, some schools hate it. Um, usually if the school has their own Kaylee band, so their own young musicians, they're usually really keen to do it. So we're trying to make, I guess, extra links, but also even we've designed the resource, so even if teachers just want to use it as a learning tool, they can just do it as a 10 minute plenary at the very end. For example, they might do some follow on questions. And I guess, especially in secondary context, what we're really keen on is showing diversity within science and in the researchers that we're, we're talking about, none of them wear lab coats unless it's actually needed. For example, you can see the band in the background and we're hoping it's a good way of discussing how creativity in, and it is an important part of STEM. And also, I guess, uh, you know, a slightly higher order thinking skill is also thinking about all models, all models that you might see in, in a textbook, um, as well as these movement models that we've created between community groups and researchers, all of them have the uh, strengths and all of them have their weaknesses as well and so actually having the opportunity to talk with learners and help support teachers and we do provide a lot of training for teachers on how you could actually have a conversation about okay well how could you, where does this model not work very well for the dance um, and actually how could you improve it as well 
Um, and actually, obviously, if the first class want to make this into a school project, some of our best projects have been linking, you know, kind of senior S3, so that's 13, 14 year old biologists with 14 year old drama class students, and they would help each other create different movements. And again, it doesn't have to be as polished as this, as you will see in the next slide. So that gives you a bit of an idea of maybe how we support research, and especially at the secondary level. Um, but as an organization now, actually a lot of our work is focusing on younger years and much more about the pedagogy of how we can actually use interdisciplinary learning, use movements um, within a science and context, both supporting STEM and science and curiosity, but also creativity within the curriculum. And so what we do more in the primary and what I kind of want to talk a little bit about is also a lot of our guides and training now at the moment and all our guides and all our resources are free, I will keep on saying that, um, is actually how do you use movement? And this came up yesterday in some of the talks um, about how actually, you know, for songs, could students come up with their own movements? And Kaylee is a great framework. And even if Kaylee isn't so well known across the pond, for example, actually very often it's just a very loose framework and, young people, and what we're trying to support is actually the important bit is how um, young learners could take what they've learned, break it into four or five, six different steps, and then create their own movements that are meaningful to them as a group, and then actually develop this mini model, if you like, and then be able to perform that. And, and a lot of our work is, is helping facilitate that, or training teachers about how to have the, the right arts, music, and science confidence to be able to facilitate that, facilitate that in classes, and all our resources help support that. And so the reasons for this is, again, both secondary is important, but actually there's lots of research suggesting that actually the reason why girls don't do physics, for example, is not because they're not good at it, it's not because they don't have fun, it's not because they don't enjoy it, they do all these things, but they don't see themselves as physicists. And so a lot of our work is trying to use this as a way of challenging, well, what does a physicist look like? What skills does a physicist have or a scientist have? And creativity is a massive part of that problem solving, being thinking about models, um, and so we're really trying to challenge that. And if you're interested in that type of research, Aspire's 2 report, which I've mentioned up here, is a really great piece of work uh, done in the UK about how actually those formations, those attitudes are already decided in primary school level and they've carried on into secondary. Um, I guess the other reasons why we like using and that whole process is that, as we were talking about, it's, it's creating, it's evaluating, it's analyzing, it's using higher order cognitive skills. So it's a great thing to be able to put into a plenary at the end of the lesson, or it could be a great school project to really stop them. Um, looking at time. And then in, in the UK, we talk a lot about science and cultural capital. So we're broadening what counts as science. So science isn't always things that go big, bop, boom, and pops and bangs. Um, and actually science can involve, um, as I said, arts, expressive arts and movements. And the last thing that we're really interested in as, as an organization is starting to pair a lot more with researchers about actually the importance of embodied movement intrinsically. So actually, is there something about using gestures and using movements and coming up with their own dances that else helps them consolidate and understand the material better? And certainly, actually, to go back to the, the science and cultural capital idea, we're, we're really encouraging them to take ownership of the dancers. They create their own movements. They create their own names. And ideally, they'll perform that. They'll perform that to the, either the rest of the class or schools. And it's a great way of engaging with parents as well. And so seeing a science dance that they've created gently might provoke parents to think a wee bit differently about what science means nowadays. It means very different things from what they might experience 20, 30 years ago. Um, and again, a lot of research suggesting that ultimately it's the parents' stereotypes about what creativity and what science are, which very often have a massive influence on young people. And so we're very interested in that kind of community setting. So I was going to quickly finish we're off. We're P7B, she's for every school. Two videos and we've written this down to science community. Young people have created themselves. And you can see that this is really like NCR, yeah. 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 So this is the dance of, of the ear. Cells in the eyes get excited. Oh, a light, it's the an eye dance. So the cells in the eyes get excited. That's this. And the message goes down the after nerve. Yeah. The message goes down the after nerve. So it's just the old... That's the move. And it crosses over because everything goes to the left side. And the other one right side of the eye. And this is the back of the brain. And finally the other goes to the back of the brain. 
Sí, ya. Es que estás más around for us. Well done, guys. Um, and. We're P7. Oh, let's see if I can get one more very quickly. See this one as well. Just to prove that it isn't stunts dancing at all. I don't. Yeah. So I think this is again. Light entering the eye. Sounds like I get excited. I like it, okay. And let's just get three blocks there. Turn down the optic nerve, so again we'll get the next move. And they're pressing over our hands to represent that cross over here. And then the back of the brain. Um, so I'm going to leave it there for the question there, and, but what I will say is that we do have a whole set of free resources available for any teachers, um, obviously the title the Scottish curriculum, but we're hopefully it will be useful for everyone else. Just there's a, some of the links over there, um, or you can just go into the website. Um, Lewis, can you type in the website um, that that you have? I know what it is, but it might be easier um, if you just type in the chat box. Um, um, what the now? Um, yes, and we have everything from climate change, even the pedagogy of how you might use movement, how you can um, use YouTube so they can pick their own tunes. Obviously, if they're writing their own songs and put um, science songs, use them. That would be amazing, uh, and we'd love to see what you guys come up with. Uh, Walter, he, Walter actually had to go to class, but he wanted to know how um, you guys can collaborate with scientists more. So at the end of the session, or if you want to answer it now, that's fine too. But I think you have some people who would love to collaborate with you um, who actually are scientists and um, they definitely would be interested in looking at the different strategies that you have with respect to how you teach something like science with all of these arts. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to collaborate. Cool. All right. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I know that you had another meeting uh, just about an hour ago in a different place. So we appreciate you hanging out with us for the hour and getting here. And um, it's awesome. Love it. No, my pleasure, honestly. Um, Bob, we're going to switch gears and we're going to uh, have Rishi, also known as Professor Carmadillo, take it away. Hi there. Uh, Hi. Yes, um, so, uh, yes, my name is Rishi. Um, I was known as uh, Professor Carmadillo. I'll, I'll sort of give a bit of instrument, uh, my background to my instrument first. So uh, this is what I play. It's called a charango. And the story behind it is the Spanish uh, took the guitar with them, or the vejuelo as it was known at the time, uh, and they went across and you know, basically killed them all and stole their gold. But they brought the power of music, so that was the first one. Uh, but they, in the mountains of the Andes, they didn't have uh, guitars to use. So someone hit upon the idea of using armadillos as a body of the guitar. So that's where this gets its shape from. And if you get, you can get real armadillo ones with like little uh, heads, uh, legs sticking out there and scales. Um, so I have a normal band, well, not a normal band, it's still a, a quirky band called Carmadillo. Uh, and then um, I started working in a uh, plant sciences department, uh, sort of, uh, you know, seven or eight years ago, and my gateway drug into science music was a song about the Arabidopsis, which is a uh, test plant used for scientists as a sort of model uh, in, in the plant world. And uh, kind of, it became, a, you know, use it as a sort of artistic metaphor for, you know, comparing it to roses, which get all the sort of glory, but aren't really that useful uh, to the hardworking Arabidopsis. Uh, and then uh, there was an organization called Geek Pop, uh, which did a thing of, uh, a couple of years ago in that time period, and so I kind of got hooked in there. Uh, and I uh, so wrote this uh, song uh, many years ago, and I won their most contrived lyric award for that. Uh, so I'll do the song first, and then do a, do a bit more uh, chatting. going to do a different song, sorry. It's 
just because of the change inside us. We grow up people and not like spiders. You may wish to die not flies, but biology says that's not wise. Plants and animals, trees and bees, different species, different sets of genes. The building blocks are just the same, but we all get built in different ways. Not a banana, you're not a bike. As human beings, we're quite alike. We all need hearts and we all need brains. The genes of us are mostly the same. Yet you and me are different. That's partly due to variants. Variant genes have faces changed, which means we get built different ways. I am me and you are you. It's the variants. Same species, same gene set, different genes have different effects. A single letter in the DNA change means we have phenotypes not the same. It could be hair, it could be eyes, it could be coriander, something we don't spy. You and I have different genes that makes us different. Variant seeds. I am you and you are you. It's the variants that help me. Cheers. So, uh, <laughs> Bob, can you make Rishi big? Okay, uh, I've had quite a few uh, burgers in that time, so <laughs> I think I'm making myself larger <laughs> in that own space. Um, that was awesome, thank you. Cheers. So, uh, I started writing a few years ago one-off songs about uh, various scientific topics and uh, did some sort of uh, a couple of shows um, as Professor Carmadillo was the, the name derived from that. Uh, then I became a, a dad basically, so everything got put on hold for a few years. Uh, but one of the feedbacks that I had from that period of time was uh, rather than doing random songs, try, try and turn it into a coherent show. So I moved into uh, the world of bioinformatics and I, um, got into this whole uh, idea of uh, let's do, why don't I do a whole uh, musical about genomics? And uh, the, you know, this became, you know, was an idea, but then a, a couple of years ago, uh, the, I work at the Welcome Genome Campus. So this is where places like the Sanger Institute and MBEBI, which are big sort of uh, in biology and, and bioinformatics world, uh, they share a campus outside of Cambridge. And, um, the campus-wide public engagement team announced a fund for uh, doing panels, uh, to, for doing a uh, projects basically on, on the public engagement sphere. And while I'm happy writing uh, songs and so forth, the problem I've had, or going back to how do you communicate this uh, in a show, is uh, doing videos is kind of like a really important thing. So I, I, I build what I do as a mi musical mini lecture. So there'd be introduction to, say there, there's an introduction to the idea of variants and uh, what they mean uh, for uh, people. And then as the song's playing, there's then a uh, sort of video playing. And I think, um, you know, it, it helps to keep bring that sort of thing lighthearted, uh, sort of, it's a public entertainment, sh edutainment show is kind of what I set out to do. Uh, but again, because there was a grant kind of thing involved, it became a bit of a STEM uh, broke, uh, encroached into that. So it was like uh, trying to keep the science accurate, but keeping it lighthearted was kind of a uh, thing. Um, so this goes back to one of the topics. I remember the uh, parody song person yesterday was chatting about how mood should match, you know, this kind of stuff you're doing. And when I created my... Um, when I created my uh, first set of songs, I tried to sort of do, it was a very artistic endeavor where, you know, like the song on Dark Matter was a weird avant-garde sort of piece and things like that. So 
um, tried to match uh, the sort of area of science being dealt with. Um, so I currently uh, do work uh, at a, for an organization called uh, Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, and we're trying to sort of uh, do lots of, uh, you know, get people to uh, share their standards on databases when they're uh, exchanging bioinformatics information. Uh, and that gives me a lot of ideas because you hear lots about, you know, this person's working from this across the world. So I kind of get a lot of uh, insight and, and ideas from that as well. So, uh, and the other interesting thing is, because I, I continue, I mean, I'm definitely not gigging as much as I uh, sort of used to. And uh, so this, doing this genomics musical, which will have its next, uh, there was a first development version shown last year. And I've got, it's, it's got its next, um, yeah, next at the weekend. So I've been rewriting things and uh, and tying up the videos and things this week weekend. Um, so the other thing has actually been because I do my normal shows every now and again, and uh, you know I'm lazy. I want to have to remember as few subs as possible. So trying to uh, remember those, uh, you know, bringing those science songs into normal t pub type concerts and stuff that I play is quite an interesting uh, take on things as well. I think. I'd, I'd like to know, this is Tiffany, I'd like to know what happens when you just um, get up to the microphone at a pub and start start doing the uh, genomics songs. So yeah, usually I uh, introduce, so usually I have a song as Mendel, which is my the, the one I'll, I'll, I'll kick off with when I'm trying to do that. And that's kind of got a good sing along to it as well. Uh, and it, so it has a good response. Um, it has some terrible light lyrics in it to, to boot. Uh, and so it's kind of like, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it was like, you know, P who wasn't recognized in his time. So I say, you know, there's a line in there, give the peas a chance. And um, uh, Does it get funnier as the night goes on and, and the hours get later? Yeah, so I think this is, this is one of the key things. I, I think it's like the, uh, so when I introduced, start off the show, you know, before the Mendel, there's obviously the idea of inheritance. And, you know, one of the slides I show, I was always, uh, uh, you know, Prince Charles with Prince William and uh, <laughs> Prince Harry, uh, alongside a photo of someone uh, Princess Diana had an, uh, allegedly had an affair with a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, obviously the kids don't understand that, but the uh, parents can pick up on that. So I think it, it is important. And though the songs may not necessarily get the humor themselves, I think the video, you can use the videos and the bits in between. And I think also in a STEM aspect, when you uh, I have quizzes at the end of the songs and one good way when you're dealing with the kids is to like, uh, you know, did Mendel grow A, a pea plant, B, a pear tree, or C, a poo plant? And, you know, you, you kind of just have some scatological reference in every single quiz. And, and There you go. Yeah, you always got to keep a little bit of the humor. <laughs> love it. I love it. Um, tell us the name of your album. Okay, so as Professor Carmadillo, uh, the album is called Giant Leaps. Um, and as, uh, but I've, I've also uh, changed my, it was only meant to be a temporary thing, uh, but I've, I've now called myself Singing Science as the, uh, is the sort of stage name I'm working on uh, this genomics musical under. So uh, I've, got, I've got a bit of, um, <laughs> yeah, identity crisis obviously going on. <laughs> I put both of those um, in the chat along with Professor Carmadillo. So giant leaps and uh, singing science. So thanks for sharing your uh, your treat with us. Is there anything else you'd like to add and let us know about what, what it is you do and your passion and how you outreach um, to different people? There you go. Uh, let me just see. No, I think that was it. <laughs> um, uh... Yeah, I think it's interesting. I, I think uh, the fact checking, there was an interesting thing that was brought up there as well earlier. And I think that's an interesting, you know, I, many of us aren't, you know, if many of us doing this area are in, a, are in uh, different fields and we're trying to write stuff that isn't our home turf, I think. So. Yeah, absolutely. And so are you interested also in sort of, um, like if you were going to write a song, are you interested in, in working with somebody that, that has like a PhD in, in genetics or something on those lines to, cool. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's definitely uh, a, a, you know, the starting point for things is getting, uh, when the idea comes in, and, and luckily our workplace in the biology realm has lots of people, you know, in that area. But I guess what, if, when I, 
just go back to uh, the the physical sciences. That's definitely where I need like okay. I don't know contacts and things. Yeah, yeah, and that's actually one of the items I'm thinking about doing here before the end of the conference is creating sort of a collaboration station so that like if you know you're looking for biology, somebody's name pops up or something on those lines. So that's good advice. Appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time today to share your art and your science. We genuinely appreciate it. Thanks. Um, Bob, we're going to switch gears and we're going to actually go over to Ben and Lisbeth, um, who are also joining us from England. Hi, guys. It's great Hello. to see you. Hello. Hi. Hi, I can hear you and see you. You look great. You seem close, close. Yeah. So, and we have a special guest. Yeah. Oh, the special guest is, uh, is Maxwell the cat. Who's, Excellent. Uh, um, well, he's, actually, he's, he's got his stage fright, so he's, yeah. <laughs> Will the cat be singing in a few minutes? That's entirely possible, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah so glad we could, uh, we could make it. So, yeah, uh, tell us what you do. Loaded, so um, we'll try and just uh, tell you a bit about what, what we're up to. Should, should I share the, share the screen here? Um, you're welcome to do that. If you have like a PowerPoint, you're welcome to do that. Um, but yeah, you don't have to. It's up to you. So, yeah, we did, we did slides because we're hard. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, that looks we great. We've been lying around from the last time. So I'll give you a quick overview of what, what we do. So, so we founded this thing called Harmony Choir here in Edinburgh um, back in 2016, was it, in June? Um, and it was originally supposed to be just a, a short research project into the effects of singing on mental health and on mental health stigma. Um, and so the, the first thing that I've learned about doing short-term projects is that they generally tend to turn into long-term projects because by the end of the 10 weeks or whatever we allocated, everybody wanted to carry on doing this thing. So we're still going. Um, we, we've got a concert uh, on Sunday actually in Edinburgh, if, you, if there's anyone in Edinburgh listening. Um, so. Uh, we, but, but the original project was, was really just a research thing. So I'm an engineer by, by training. Um, uh, Lisbeth here is uh, a clinical psychologist by training and we both do music for fun. And it was Lisbeth's sort of idea to, to do this. So I'm gonna let her talk about, uh, about what we did. I think we lost an interactive uh, conversation, right? With, uh, I'm here. Oh, yeah, so yeah. Just, yeah. Just, just I just I three. stopped my video since uh, it might be distracting, but I'm here. We can see you okay. and, and we can see your slides. Yep. Um, so yeah, um, just a bit about the start of the project. Um, um, I used to be in choirs myself and I'm a clinical psychologist uh, by training and uh, currently doing a PhD at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and I got some funding because I wanted to uh, do something about uh, mental health stigma and just normalizing mental health. Um, and I thought music is a really good way to do that. And there's a lot of research, um, uh, increasing res uh, yeah, evidence base uh, for um, the effects of music on health and mental health. Um, so I thought it would be a good combination. Um, so we recruited, uh, just to talk a bit about um, the, the project, we recruited uh, people from the general population um, and it was supposed to be a good reflection of the ratio of mental health uh, uh, issues that people normally have. Um, in their backgrounds um, and uh, what we wanted to do is bring people in touch with each other without of course uh, because of confidentiality reasons uh, without disclosing what uh, people's background uh, was but uh, by seeing that people are just people instead of uh, a label um, and people just getting together singing together uh, seeing if that changed anything and uh, we ran the project for two months um, and yeah, here's uh, some of the demographics. Uh, there were people who never sang in a choir before, so that was also really exciting for them. And we had um, nine rehearsals and a show at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival as part of the Just Festival. And uh, yeah, here is a, a reflection of uh, people's mental health backgrounds. Um, and um, yeah, we had six different groups and you can see with the blue and green that uh, it was about half and half people that um, had ever had some uh, mental health symptoms in their lives now or in the past or a diagnosis or people that generally or rarely or never had any mental health issues. Um, and yeah, we didn't have a lot of dropouts, fortunately. Um, and uh, yeah, people from the different groups set kind of the same rate of attending the rehearsals. And what we wanted to know um, is we, we looked at a couple of, um, uh, yeah, uh, mental health 
um, yeah, uh, measures. Uh, but what I was most interested in um, was the uh, stigma. Um, internalized stigma is something um, when people get the diagnosis and um, they um, yeah, have a label, they feel, can feel different and they can feel less than other people. And we wanted to change, uh, change that and see if people judge themselves differently after two months and if uh, people in the choir judged other choir members or, uh, sorry, uh, people with mental health issues in general uh, differently. Um, and uh, maybe go to the next, yep. Uh, we also measured at every rehearsal, um, yeah, on a scale from, uh, I think, was it one to 10 or zero to 10? Um, we let people uh, rate their sense of well-being, enjoyment and connectedness. And we had two hour rehearsals. So uh, these were the scores, so the average scores before and after every rehearsal. And you can already see if you go back <laughs> to the other yeah, slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, that's uh, it went up um, after every rehearsal. And I think there was a difference. No, you know, you can't <laughs> see that. But um, yeah, we did statistical analysis um, and uh, the significance level of uh, 0.05. And um, yeah, uh, well-being, connectedness and enjoyment increased after every rehearsal and, and there was no difference between the two groups except for, I mean, the people with mental health issues in their background were not, except for the first rehearsal. So that's also very good that uh, people with mental health issues also uh, benefited from uh, taking part in the rehearsals. And then this is the next uh, slide um, that shows the general improvement. So you can see that's a nice kind of bell-shaped curve. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, that was the, the short-term effect. Um, if you want a quick mood boost and feel less lonely, then the singing in the choir can be really effective, apparently. Right, so, yeah. um, so these are the measures that we used. Um, so this is not so much about music. Um, I forgot to mention one of the aims that I also had with this project is by putting up a show and um, inviting BBC and STV and uh, a mental health charity um, to uh, yeah, the rehearsal. Um, and we also made a documentary that uh, we'll put in a link in the chat box later. Um, yeah, just to, to spread the word that um, you, you know that you have the movement, the social prescribing movement, um, the, the use of arts and, and non-medical um, yeah, activities uh, like singing in a choir uh, can be good you know, for well-being and mental health. So um, we also wanted to spread that message and show that message and also show the audiences, and we are still doing that, um, show the audiences that everybody has mental health and we always emphasize uh, that the background of the choir and that it was a research project. Um, so we, you know, um, educate people about um, what research projects are and that anything basically can be a research project if you um, do it in a rigorous way and um, structured. Um, and yeah, we just try to reach a lot of people about uh, mental health is normal and um, everybody has mental health. And you can't see who has mental health issues or not. So that's a change in stigma that we try to, uh, yeah, bring. Um, and what is um, really nice is that a, a big anti-stigma, I mean, anti-mental health stigma organization here in Scotland uh, has recently adopted the model and they started to acquire in Glasgow uh, by Liam. And Liam is a service user um, yeah, who, who really wanted to do this. And uh, he came over to one of the rehearsals and he was adamant that he wanted to show that people with mental health uh, issues can do things just like anybody else. And he is uh, showing that, improving that. So uh, they are on their third rehearsal just now. So, um, so these are the measures, uh, to go back to the screen, these are the measures that uh, we used. And um, there's lots of other measures that I won't talk about. There was also less change on some of the measures for mental health was no change, unfortunately. But there's so much um, evidence out there that saying is good for mental health that I'm not that bothered about that. Um, and anecdotally, um, yeah, people in the choir uh, or in other choirs always say that singing is so good for them so, um, and that it can be very life-changing. Um, in fact, there is another PhD student here, Shelley Coyne in Edinburgh, who is looking at choirs for homeless people uh, and how uh, life-changing it can be for that group. But uh, yeah, there was a, a change uh, on uh, these two measures over time, uh, and that was over, only over two months. Uh, you had to correct for uh, the positive attitude that people had at the start. 
towards mental health because if people already had that then there was no change but um, in general people um, had a more positive attitude or a less negative attitude towards mental illness after the project so, uh, and um, the good thing is that the uh, project didn't uh, have any um, side effects um, because uh, yeah these were the scores on the scale from one to five about uh, potential adverse um, side effects. Oh, I must also mention that the choir was not any kind of therapy or music therapy in any sense. Um, it was just a choir like any other. Uh, Benji here uh, is the musical director. And <laughs> um, yeah, so um, people could talk about their mental health if they wanted to. And um, we um, had uh, ticket sales donated to, and we still uh, have all our profits go to mental health, usually mental health charities, sometimes another uh, charity, but I think it, so far it's like 99% mental health charities. And so we still raise money uh, for mental health. Um, and yeah, what else is there to say? Um, There's some pictures. <laughs> yeah, and I um, let Ben talk for the remaining, uh, couple of minutes um, to say what it's been like for him to be part of this as a non-scientist. Um, <gasps> oh, <laughs> oh, I should not Gosh. say that. Oh, I'm so, saying totally well, the wrong thing. Anyway, about not being the researcher on this project. Sorry, yeah. I'm correcting that. So I get that a lot as an engineer, sort of being called a non-scientist, and it's kind of true. Um, but yeah, I mean, my involvement in this whole thing was really uh, 100% on the musical side and not so much on the research side, but it's been great to, to see that go on. And what it's given us is kind of this, this story that we can talk about uh, all of the stuff that we've done. And these, you know, these guys here who are kind of part guinea pig, part chorister, um, and they now have you know, this experience that they can talk about. Um, and it's it's been it's been really interesting to to see the response from that and almost every audience that we have is really fascinated by this this kind of background that we have so we've done a lot of outreach for sort of social science stuff um completely by accident uh really that uh, we we never really expected it to 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 go that way we were supposed to last two months but the crime members did not want to stop so they asked ben if, uh, benji if, uh, and, if we could continue. Yeah. and how long have you been going strong here after those two months like what's what's so your total like, it's like three years now so it was wow. June 2015 and now now it's uh, 2019 so yeah and the, the, there's no sign of, of any of that up so, uh, oh. yeah no it's been a, a, a great experience and, and really interesting and, and on the way we have bumped into people like Lewis who we heard from yeah. before mm -hmm. Um, we actually performed with him at one of his uh, uh, Kayleys a uh, year or so ago, uh, which was great fun. We had all the guys dancing away. So uh, it's kind of a small world, this uh, uh, this whole uh, music and, and science overlap thing. So I need to uh, get together with uh, Rishi because I know uh, I've been on stage with Helen as well in my dim and distant past. So we need to we need to get the, the whole panel together at some point and do some, do some singing. Oh, I think uh, that's us. Um, yeah, we're in the final minute. Time, so, so, um, yeah, so it, anybody, anybody in Edinburgh, uh, <laughs> it's an inclusive non-auditioning choir. Anybody over 18 can join. So feel free to contact us. We also have yeah. a documentary. Um, I think a documentary promo is in the next slides. Yeah, there's a, there's, there's a yeah. link here as well yeah. that's in um, the slides that we've uploaded. If you have that, uh, find that link, then there is also a link to the yeah. full documentary that's uh, uh, husbands of one of the choir members actually um, added together for us from the yeah. footage we gathered. So we can put all this on the chat as well, so it's all there. Yeah, that's great. And we'll get that all set up in, in also the, um, like the program. You'll have to give us about a day or so, but we'll get all of those links and stuff in there. Um, I think what you guys are doing is amazing. As someone who's an educator, I'm a teacher by trade, and this is such a such a prevalent issue in today's world that I think it's really cool that you're taking sort of a proactive stance to it and, and definitely um, trying to make it something that um, you should talk about. And so I think um, maybe, you know, if you have any interest in collaborating, not just with uh, scientists or researchers, but also at educators, I think that would be a cool thing to, to do to share your craft with, um, 
you know, how other people might be able to improve the lives of, of anybody. So I think that's really amazing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I think one, one of the things that's really great about it is because it's just a choir at the end of the day, it's a really easy get in. You can fit a choir in anywhere. Um, yeah. You know, just, uh, you know, we get invited to perform all over the place and then, and then off we go. Um, and then, and then people start to hear about, you know, the background of it. And oh, that's interesting. So, yeah. But well, thank you very much for inviting yeah, us. It's you. been a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. And if anybody has any questions for um, Helen, Lewis, Rishi, or uh, Ben or Lisbeth, feel free to type it into the chat box. Um, I think, um, actually, I have to give Helen credit. She was the one that nominated <laughs> all five of you to do this. So I appreciate that from her end. Um, she said, you're going to love these people. You, this, this needs to be your panel. So um, I think she definitely had, um, she had, she says it's her fault in, in the comment box. Sorry. Um, but no, I think it was great. I think you guys had a great combination and, and I'm thinking maybe we should have like a voices, um, UK reunion for you all somewhere. Yeah. Uh, that would be pretty fun. That's so nice. yeah. Awesome. Um, <laughs> I'm going to wait for just a second. Anybody want to add um, anything about your next show? Like you want to shout out like, hey, come see me here um, while I'm looking at the questions here? Um, uh, we've got lots of events in it, but, um, and across Scotland, but I don't know if, uh, um, if anyone's out there. Yeah, we'll just go into the website or Facebook and you'll find we've always got three Kayleys. Um, I guess one thing I did want to add, and actually something that's come up a few times, and it links really nicely with quite a few of the different talks, you know, is that, you know, actually, Helen and Rishi um, are musicians, so I'm a professional musician as well, and then obviously we've got more musicians in terms of the choirs as well, and I guess one thing that I, within science and music, that I'm always a little bit wary of, especially now, is that very often there's, there's this kind of like, oh, let's use music, and let's use arts to kind of teach something a bit more meaningful which is science we're going to trick people into science because that's more useful and i think there's something that, that that's kind of a i, I think sometimes it's, it's done completely unintentionally but i think we have to be very careful and um, not that i'm saying anyone's done that but i think i've been much more clear recently about just talking about the intrinsic value of creativity and the intrinsic value of arts for their own sake as much as anything else uh, and obviously the work the harmony choir are doing is showing there's well-being benefits as well but just being a little bit clearer about that, actually, especially, I don't know what it's like in the US, but certainly in Scotland, probably the rest of the UK as well, budgets being cut. The first thing that gets cut is very often the yeah. arts and arts, arts um, provisions and councils. And so actually, uh, we're starting to find ourselves in a bit, bit of a position that um, people book us in because we, th we thought it'd be, oh, we'll go via arts and then we'll put STEM in, you know, a few years ago. That was kind of our our USP and now I don't know if any of the other panelists find this but actually we're probably coming in because everyone's like oh no STEM's important and everyone's telling us to STEM and actually our key message is really actually it doesn't matter what job you do creativity is really really important for your health your well-being for the, the value of it I don't know if that resounds with any of the panelists yeah no I mean I think that's a great thing to mention that the arts you know for the sake of the arts are genuinely important absolutely anybody want to chime in on that yeah, so I think this is interesting because I I kind of went through this like I, I I do the music first historically I was in a band and then I switched to doing sciencey songs, and like I said I, it, there was a funding thing up available and that kind of had to have a STEM kind of focus to it. So it's interesting how you know the money helps because it you know, helps your creativity, but there's it's a bit like uh, I guess you know, your artists. Uh, you know, always had patrons kind of thing. So I found that um, because this is this is something I'm doing as a sideline. It's not a you know uh, a show I take on tour at the moment. And maybe you know I'll, I'll do small tours and things. But uh, I think that funding thing made me think about STEM as uh, an end product. You know, mm. shaping product. As it were. Helen, Ben, Lisbeth, you have anything to say about that? looks like I'm going to have to organize um, a show with all of us in now because <laughs> that's what I'll, I spent. I'll do it. <laughs> I'm organizing, if anyone's in London, I'm organizing it. I've organized a fundraiser on the Cutty Sark, uh, this very historic ship in London uh, that's called A Night That Launched a Thousand Ships. And it has, um, it's all science communicators 
uh, not just all science communicators, they're all female science communicators. Um, they're not just all female science communicators, they're female science communicators called Helen. <laughs> because really? we wanted to, <laughs> to prove a point. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, Helen's the face that launched a thousand ships. Um, apart from there's two token non-Helens, uh, but it, it, we were trying to prove a point uh, that it's, um, there are so many brilliant science communicators who are men. There are so many brilliant ones that are women. Uh, you get journalists who say, oh, where are all the, where are all the women doing science communication? And uh, we say, well, look, well, there's six of them. They're just, that's just the ones called Helen. Yeah. Are southeast of England um yeah so uh my 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 current thing that I'm doing more of than writing songs is organizing weird events to prove points yeah uh, that's great so we, um, prove point. <laughs> we have a question what what date will that take place and in, in oh a, uh, it's 27th of October I'll, I'll post a little link to it here um it's gonna be very silly <laughs> and it's in London it's in London in Greenwich on on uh the the world's most historic tea clipper. Uh, you're really going to be on a ship? Oh, uh, yeah, we are underneath the ship. The ship is in dry Ooh. dock. And okay. we are not, not on it, but underneath it. There's a picture of it on, on the, the thing. So, um, Oh, yeah. yeah. So we, we have the, the link for, for it right there in the chat box. Awesome. <laughs> so I great. definitely need to uh, find some way to have a science Kaylee and a choir performance. And Rishi's band. Well, I was toying with uh, going up to Edinburgh for the Fringe Festival one year, so I, uh, maybe we should all do that next. Uh, that should we be should a Fringe. Yeah, yeah. August. Yeah. Yeah. Watch this space. Let's do it. Let's do a big yeah. bonanza. Yeah, we need to get some science songs in our repertoire as well, because that's the one thing we don't really have. So, uh, yeah. Uh, really. Maybe you could travel up there on the ship. Like we. <laughs> that would be actually a pretty funny thing, a bunch of people singing going right into the port. I think you would really make a statement that way. <laughs> <laughs> There's a port, the Port of Leith. Leith. Let's go to Edinburgh. I actually, last time I went to Edinburgh, I saw a Chekhov play on a barge and because it was about, it was the Three Sisters, so it was all about traveling and going nowhere. So the barge actually travels down the river while it was being, the play was being performed in this narrow boat. And <laughs> You start back where it was, so it's beautiful. All the metaphor. pieces that are coming together. <laughs> I see it. I see it happening. <laughs> Maybe that'll be the fourth voices right there. <laughs> Never know. <laughs> Thank you so much to our panel. You guys were awesome. Um, and you came all the way from England over, we're in Pennsylvania. Bob and I are not in the same city. Many people think we're sitting right next door to each other. <laughs> that man was actually my husband. He's actually home today from work. That's not Bob. Uh, and so we genuinely appreciate everything, your time, your expertise, um, everything you've been willing to offer. And I think it's for a great cause. So um, we, we thank you. It was very generous of you to share your experience, um, your art, and also your science with us. And we hope that you'll stay in contact with us as we continue on. Thank you for having us. Our Thanks, pleasure. guys. All right. Thank you. Cheers, as you say. Cheerio.